office. Do you remember when, what year Jim Cooler's lab? You, maybe you weren't even there then. I want to say 70s. I think mean, it was probably the 70s. And I'm not even sure of the whole story out there, but uh, Jim Cooler and some other people at UC Davis were playing around in their laboratory and found this mutant E. coli. And it was one that did not have the O chain on it. And so they called that the, the rough mutant. So it had the, you know, the core and it had the lipid A, but it did not have that O polysaccharide on it. And so it also lacked some uh, uh, uridine enzyme. Um, that polysaccharide, and it exposed, because it, we did not have this chain out here, it actually exposed and allowed the immune system to kind of get to know that portion of the, of the organism and mount an immune response against it. And which was fortuitous because this is the one that's shared amongst all our E. coli. So by developing a vaccine to this E. coli 011B4, Immunity stimulated by that particular mutant cross-protected against Klebsiella, Salmonella, and some of the other ones we have out there. So, um, started off as a mutant, you know, it was, and it was actually taken by two different companies at that point. Um, Poultry Health uh, took it and developed the J5 E. coli bacterium, which uh, was then bought by Upjohn, and then ultimately as a Zoetis vaccine, it was Envirocor J5. The other portion of that uh, little scheme went to Sanofi, which was the parent company to Mariel. They marketed it as an E. coli and bacterin toxoid and is now JVAC. And then in kind of parallel research, someone found a rough mutant of Salmonella and developed that into another core antigen vaccine, and that one is now endo Endovac Bovi. And in my world, we use the Endovac Dairy. Um, so all really similar paths back there, um, but all you know, really of great consequence to the dairy industry. So, and we just don't take those vaccines and put them in a vial. We actually put adjuvants in it, and the adjuvants will affect that efficacy or the immune response to that, to those uh, antigens that you're putting in there. So it's an agent that is mixed in that vial that modifies that immune response. There's a variety of them out there. We use oils, aluminum salts. We use uh, sub-immunizing bacterial doses. So um, for example, Beringer Ingelheim, their express respiratory vaccines has sub-immunizing doses of Histophilus somni. Just a little something to kind of grab that immune system's attention and pull it in. We have saponins, oil, water, emulsions, and then we have some newer ones that are really great at presenting antigen to the immune system. Um, those are the polymer-based ones, and the one in JVAC is actually called Tandem. So what do we do? We, you know, we're really looking for an antibi antibody response, so we're looking for core-specific uh, lipopolysaccharides to neutralize those, uh, those toxins. Um, and these antibodies, as they attach, you know, they promote clearance through uh, opsonization and phagocytosis. So some of the early studies that we did th with this took vaccinated animals, challenged them with known doses of E. coli, and then measured bacterial clearance and compared those to a negative control that did not get vaccinated. And we found that um, cattle that were vaccinated and then challenged cleared bacteria much, much more quickly than the negative controls. So initially, the, the initial work was looking at uh, serologic response. So in this particular study, and so we're measuring, you know, do these work, do we get an immune response to it? So in this particular study, they looked at uh, uh, vaccination with uh, Envirocor. Um, those animals were vaccinated on day 0, 21, and 42. Uh, compared to JVAC, which is a two-dose vaccine. Those were vaccinated on 21 and 42. And then we also looked at the R17 Salmonella vaccine, and those were vaccinated on 20, days 21 and 42. And then just measured antibody titers. So these animals were bled on days 0, 21, 42, 56, and 84. And we just measured, uh, just looked to see if we had an increase in antibodies to these vaccines. And so this is the results of that, and we can see that you know, all three of these vaccines actually were able to stimulate uh, a good antibody response to those vaccines. 
You know, so how do we know these work? I think, you know, that was one of Tom's questions he sent me. Well, what, you know, how do we know they work? Um, I can say from clinical practice, they work, they work great, but, you know, also being in the science world, we need to see the proof, right? The proof is in the pudding or the proof is in the peer review, I guess. So, um, so there have been a couple of, there's a numerous ones that have been done out there. I picked out a, a couple. Um, mostly because I was involved in them at some level. So, you know, one of the things with a vaccination, we've had questions today about are all animals vaccinated, which animals get vaccinated. You know, the key thing to va designing a vaccine protocol is you want to get ahead of your disease, right? Um, if that disease is running rampant through the, through the, uh, you through the population, you may stop it, but you know, you're really getting it ahead of anticipated problems. So this is a year in the life of a dairy cow. So she's had a calf here, and she's milking along, milking along. She milks for about 305 days, give or take. Um, we then give her a period of rest towards the last of that that calf development, we call it the dry period, um, because she's not milking anymore. One of my friends who's not from a dairy background said, if, they, if you have dry cows, do you have wet cows? And I said, yeah, I guess you do. Um, so, and this line actually looks at the risk of that cow getting new mastitis cases. And so there's a lot that happens around here. Here we're asking this cow to have a baby, you know, spend 12 hours or maybe up to three days in a hospital pen and then go to work again. So there's a lot happening around here where this, this girl is pretty immunosuppressed. You know, bacteria, where she might be able to fight off a bacteria out here because she's uh, acclimated, around here her risk is higher. So risk goes up here, risk goes up at drying off because we've suddenly taken a cow who's milking 60 pounds and then made her say, nope, you're not gonna milk anymore. So milk is the perfect food for you know, babies and calves and adults. It's also good for bacteria. So if we're not milking her anymore, you know, there's good food in there. Um, so there's a risk there and then there's a risk again at calving. And really in this fresh period here and here is when we tend to see when these cows are most stressed, producing the high amounts of, of, of milk, uh, suppressed immune system, they're at most risk for uh, clinical coliform mastitis. And so what we've done is actually put our vaccines, we try to put our vaccines here ahead of the stress. So we usually vaccinate when we take them and make them a dry cow, and then maybe three weeks or so before they calve. So this study was done um, in four herds. This was some of the original licensing studies. So they looked at four, four herds, Holstein animals. These animals either got the vaccine or got a negative control, got a placebo. And the people who gave it and the people who cared for these animals were blinded. They didn't know who had what. So it was given at minus 60 days, so at dry off, and then three weeks before calving. And so they had 733 cows in the study, so we had about 375 on the vaccinates and 360 on the controls. Pretty large trial, so if anybody's out here designing trials, we like big numbers, not three cows and three cows. Um, these were the results. So these were the controls were the ones that got the sham vaccinating vaccination. Um, the, the, green the green line are the ones that got the vaccination. So we looked at all coliform cases, so that would be E. coli, Klebsiella mostly, and then we just looked at, just broke them out by plain old E. coli clinical cases, and we can see that there was a good protective effect with that vaccination. They also looked at, you know, milk production, because I said initially, you know, one of the big consequences to mastitis is decreased milk production. So in this case, they used three of the four herds. One of the herds did not record daily milk weights. And so the same two treatment groups, and then they looked at incidence of clinical mastitis, so how many new mastitis cases those cows got, what their milk production was, and then we looked at, you know, um, other kind of parameters. So we looked at reproductive parameters. You know, our goal is to get those girls pregnant again. So days open, you know, how long did it take her to get pregnant? How many times did we have to inseminate her to get pregnant? And what the overall pregnancy rate was? Yeah, this was... Yeah, this is Wilson, yeah. And then, so in this one, I'm sorry, this was another study. They had 251 vaccinates, 306 controls. Um, of those animals that were vaccinated or controls, 120 had clinical mastitis in their lactation. And then they looked at um, bleeding these animals. They looked at their titers. So the vaccinate had higher 
uh, immunoglobulin titers, IgM and Ig1 and Ig2. They were less likely to be culled or die. They had more rapid E. coli clearance and decreased somatic cell count, which is our body's response to infection in the butter. They saw no difference in milk pro in reproduction, but in this one, the vaccinates had significantly less milk loss. So, you know, we were able, the animals still got infected at, at about the same rate, but the results of those, infect if those infections were decreased. So just to kind of conclude, get on to our next speaker. You know, coliform mastitis is a serious, you know, any mastitis is serious on our dairy cows. I think of coliform from my, you know, from an animal loss, a death, and animal suffering, you know, probably our number one uh, clinical mastitis. There's lots of things we can do in prevention. You know, we can do management with a shovel, we can look at equipment, we can look at, at uh, nutrition and hygiene, but another thing we can use is strategic vaccination. And so by using these uh, preventative vaccination protocols, you know, we can reduce animal suffering, we can reduce antibiotic use on the dairy, um, and we can make sure we're always producing a wholesome product for our consumers. So I will actually probably, since I'm probably a little over time, um, hold questions, you know, if you want to ask me during the career thing or afterwards, I'd be happy to answer anything. So thank you. Thank you.